Hello, ladies, gentlemen, and fellow gambling degenerates. Welcome to the dawn of a new era. PSN Radio is here to stay your new home for all things Philadelphia sports. And I think it's only right that we're the first ever podcast on PSN Radio. We've got to spread some love, is what we're calling this one. And it was a very impulse name. Myself, Liam Jenkins, Ricky Amendeo. Um, we've, we've both keen gamblers, to say the least. I mean, it was probably, if you're going to romanticise it, and you, know, you look eyes across the room, it would be the equivalent of, you know, looking at someone's phone and seeing a notification for FanDuel pop up and going, oh, hello. <laughs> and uh, since then, it has been no looking back. And Ricky might be the only person I know that not only bets as much as I do, but actually wins way more. So it made sense for us to lock heads and get a show together for you guys to bring you as many picks as we can. So you've heard me talk about Ricky. Uh, he's been writing a lot of PSN. He's one of our absolute wonder kids, I call him. And um, how are you today, good sir? How are you feeling? Uh, I'm all good. I mean, this Monday I turned 21, so I officially won't be betting under my or having my mom place the bets, quote unquote. So <laughs> um, I'm super excited just to be able to hit the casino and sports book next weekend. But for this weekend, I mean, I'll have to go quote unquote to my mom to make these bets still so it's okay wink wink nudge nudge uh, so just for some background then can you remember the first ever sports bet you placed okay so if we're talking uh, oh, oh, i should say your mum placed you know <laughs> so if we're talking better in betting in general i remember i used to play on this app called draft and it was essentially like a daily fantasy but you would play against like one or two other people it was really cool you would do like a quick draft essentially where like you do a snake draft you do there's like five rounds and you pick a team and i don't think i lost more than five times using that app i paid off a student loan um i don't remember the first lineup i had but that was the first set of bets like i i made a good amount of money and that's kind of where i got hooked per se that's a bad thing to say but and then i remember i downloaded fanduel And I used to only bet on Philadelphia teams, and that's a really bad thing now that I look back on it, but I didn't want to bet on things I didn't know. So I was betting on, because like obviously I know Philly teams more than any other team. So I remember I probably, it was in the summer, so I probably bet on the Phillies. Um, And I've been in love with no run first innings and first five money lines since I started betting. So it was probably a first run, or first five innings money line or... Uh, no run first inning in a Phillies game. That's fair. I mean, mine started kind of similar where I just turned 18, which is it's the legal age here. So we've got a, th- a four-year difference of, of experience, I guess. But um, I used to finish work from the video game store I worked at, meet my friends, and I used to finish at two. So we would go to Subway, eat for a bit, and then go to the bar and just place a load of like $1 <laughs> or £1 bets. And there'd be like 12, 13 fold parlays of like as many teams as possible. And we'd sit there watching the football or the soccer, just praying one. And they never did. They never had any chance. And eventually you start looking then at horses and other sports. And when I started Philly Sports Network, I was like, okay, well, let's see how we're doing it. And started realizing that with the knowledge that I was starting to gain, I had a lot more insight into lines and when the lines moved and how to make a little bit of money. And I think the biggest highlight was undoubtedly the competition we had earlier this year where a bookmaker essentially approached us ahead of the playoffs in the NFL and said, we're running a promotion with you and Crossing Broad, essentially, where we'd love you guys to come in and pick the playoffs. And whoever gets the most picks right by the end of the Super Bowl gets $1,000. So obviously, being the lead gambling degenerate that I am, went full send with it. We actually won it. And we spread all the money out among the PSN writers. Ricky bought a new Lamborghini. And here we are today looking (laughs) to pick up where we left off. So what I thought we would do, Ricky, and I know we discussed this very, very early on, is we're staging it to spread in the love. You know, we want to take our knowledge, our picks, our gambling degeneracy and share it with you. So we're in very much a gambling bromance. But what if we get tempted? You know, what if we want to cheat? on the other and that's not good all right we don't want that toxicity here we've got no room for the 1975 but we're going to run a segment every week called cheat or no cheat where essentially 
We're gonna swap picks and I'm gonna give Ricky my best pick and give him a convincing argument He's gonna do the same to me and I've got to decide do I want that new shiny supermodel or do I want to stay at home with the love of my life and we're gonna work out what we do but if we swap picks we have to bet it that's the thing like we have to these are our best bets we're gonna bet them anyway so we're gonna switch him if Ricky can tempt me off of my ledge of betting my best bet to bet his it's intriguing. So I'll, I'll start with you, Ricky. What is your the line you're going to tempt me with? What I'm sat there curling my hair around my finger right now. What have you got for me? So I uh, actually wanted to go a little bigger for the first week of this, and I was doing a lot of like a lot of research, like I normally do, probably a little more than normal. And uh, I actually came up with a teaser, but then after I teased it, I realized it was better odds to just do the money line. Um, so I did the Bills and Eagles, and at first it would have been, I believe, Bills minus a half and Eagles plus a half. So it was literally the same thing as just a win as long as they don't tie. And uh, that comes out to minus 119. Uh, essentially, I looked at it this way. The Bills and the Eagles are two similar teams in terms of betting, I guess, where you're going to have... Similar matchups against divisional opponents. I believe the Bills play the Jets. Eagles play Washington. And the Washington football team, actually. And uh, it's going to be a tough, gritty game. It's, I believe both spreads were around like five, five and a half, six and a half, something like that. And that's a little crazy to me for a divisional game with two teams that always go down to the wire, especially with Eagles and Washington. I know for sure. Always go down to the wire, at least to the fourth quarter. So... I was thinking, put them together. They're both going to win. They're going to pull the win out of their butts. Um, the money line themselves weren't worth it. So the parlay together with two teams that are going to come out with wins and definitely probably not going to show why they why they should win until the fourth quarter. So I wouldn't want to touch that spread. But money lines are definitely the lock this week. Oh, do you know what? I am tempted. And I wasn't thinking I'd do that. I was so certain of coming into this thinking, I'm not budging. I've got a hell of a bet. I'm going to lump my house on it. But on the notes that I've made, there are about, there are three games over this weekend where I'm like, if it came to having to lump the entire future of PSN on a game, the Buffalo one was one of them. And Philadelphia, I like the line. I'm kind of on the same as you. We'll get into that a little bit later. It's just a parlay for money lines. Do you know what? Like... I wasn't expecting this, but if we're taking the spread out, because there was the minus five that got me, like, the Eagles have beat, I won't want to ruin the latest segment, but the Eagles have beat in Washington, I think, six times in a row dating back to 2017. So, I like that. I didn't fancy the spread just for a couple different reasons, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I think, do you know what? I, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to be a dirty, dirty man. I'm going to cheat, and I'm, I'm going to play your bet. So, uh, I mean... I'll probably be playing both of ours, honestly, but I know it's a piece of purpose, so I won't. But. <laughs> all right, so the question is, are you going to do the dirty back on me, or are you going to uh, say, like, all right, so my here. best bet of the week is it's just one. It's only one. It's no no parlay, nothing saucy, but I'm taking Denver plus two and a half. Now, this is a few days away, but there is often that, um, I think, predicated idea that Denver have a lot of home field advantage because they play 7,000 feet in the air and no one can adjust to it, especially in week one and two, like the first weeks of the season, uh, any road team coming into Denver playing in the altitude is a bit of a pain, right? So mm. the way I look at it is not only have you got Denver who have played for six weeks at that altitude with camp, there's no OTAs, there's no preseason. So you're going to have Tennessee who are traveling across the country playing at 10 p.m. their time. That which is super late. Like if they were going to travel, like if they were playing that on their time zone, it'd be 10 p.m. So they're going to new altitude, where teams typically gas out in the third quarter at 10 p.m. And is Derek Henry going to rule the world that game? More than likely for three quarters. I would love it. I love taking points. Like I really don't like laying them where I can. I always go for the dog. So if you're telling me I get Drew Locke, who went four and one down the stretch last year. Now as KJ Hamler and Jerry Judy at his disposal, I'm sold. I'm I'm in. Like I'm take two point five points. That's nearly a field goal with those receivers. If they gas out Derrick Henry, and let's not forget that Joe Flacco last year beat them sixteen to nothing, and that was the game where they pulled Mario, so they put in Tannehill, and that kick started that new era of football. So I know that's not the best game to look at, but. 
I'm, I'm really hard pressed to go anything other than Denver plus two and a half here. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> so I, I actually color coded my notes and essentially one was basically like, for sure, I'm confident. One was like, I'm going to need a little convincing. And one was like, avoid spread money line at all costs to a player prop. And this one was in the middle for me. This is going to be really, really like super duper interesting. Like there's so many questions. I don't want to get in too much just because I know we'll probably be talking about this game later too. But there's so many questions going into this game. Like, are the Titans actually that good? Are we really talking about Ryan Tannehill in this gleaming light now? Is Drew is Drew Locke really ready to break out? Like, they, I don't think Von Miller's playing. Like, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. Maybe when we talk about it later, I'll, I'm going to come back to it. He's being loyal. He's not cheating. Okay, all right, fine. You be loyal. I, think I, I want it. Like, my first instinct was like, yes, Broncos. And then I was like, oh, that's tough because do you really want to bet against a team that just made it? They meant, what, the AFC Championship game? Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Oh, that's tough. It's, it, it, that's the thing. It's the, the only thing stopping me. But what I do, even with Von Miller down, like, the re- I, I like to think there's a reason that line's staying fairly stable and not gone any heavier. You still got Jarrell Casey who used to play for the Titans. Like, so he's now on the roster as well as a defensive tackle. I'd like to think he's got some schematic knowledge of how to stop Derrick Henry, especially when there's no preseason. So that would help. I, I don't know. But I mean, especially with snow expected on Tuesday as well. That's another thing. Like, apparently Monday's meant to be good. But if there's snow as well, or any kind of like low altitude, very cold, I, I just, I would ride Denver. And... I do that against most teams. It would take a lot for me to not ride that. Um, but well, it's interesting. Okay, all right. So I'm cheating, and Ricky's staying loyal, which for the uh, brand, I mean, which is quite. You know, Ricky's a taken man in real life. I'm single, so maybe maybe that's playing a role. I don't know. Ricky staying at home. He's a, he's a safe boy. I, I prefer his bet to mine, though. To be honest, I'm gonna I'm gonna think about it though. Don't don't <laughs> ruin me. I, I'm debating. It's like that. Where you're thinking about like you can look but can't taste type yeah, thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, ooh, do I want to take? All right, all right, I gotta think about that. All right, so let let's shift gears and let's get into the games now that aren't our best bets. I'm sure we're gonna have some pros and cons to each one. First one that that's on my radar: New England at Miami. Obviously, two rival teams. You love to see a Miami upset. Uh, New England six point five favorites so far. What are your thoughts on this one? I'm so happy we started with this. <laughs> I was sitting there doing so many notes, and this game stood out to me. So, again, there's so many questions going into this game. Like, the main storyline, I guess, going into this game in general is Bill Belichick without Tom Brady. Yeah. So, that's like, ooh, is he going to be able to do turn Cam Newton into some – dual threat quarterback because we all know Cam Newton can run for days but he doesn't have the best arm I guess you could say in terms of like accuracy completion stuff like that but I really don't think there's a clear winner in this game I mean there's going to be a winner by the score but I don't think there's really like the only they're going to be moral victories but for each team to try to see what they have going into this season Mm. I know this is a divisional game and it could really mean a lot at the end of the season but I think the storylines are going to be much more Patriots are going to take victories on their side. Dolphins are going to take victories on their side, regardless of the score. But what I will say is the Dolphins aren't a unit that the Patriots should fear. I guess you could say, if you look at the 2019 Dolphins, their vulnerability against mobile quarterbacks literally stands out immediately. So, they played Lamar Jackson last year. Lamar threw 324 yards and five passing touchdowns. Um, Dak went off for 263, two t- passing touchdowns and a rushing touchdown. Wentz went for 310 and three touchdowns. Josh Allen in game one uh, against them went for 202 and two passing touchdowns. And then Josh Allen went even better in the second game against them and did 256 yards, three touchdowns, and a rushing touchdown. So that that Dolphins team is ready to be exposed. I don't know if Cam Newton will be putting up the numbers of Game 2 Josh Allen or Lamar Jackson, but I I do think that uh, there are going to be points to be scored, and I don't know if I touch that money line, 
But I love the over in that game. It is plus 100 right now, but I love the over in that game. Right, we've got our first trench battle of the afternoon. Okay. That's interesting. There, because I, the way I look at it, I think it's going under, if I'm honest. Okay. And there are a couple different reasons for it. And I, I love what you've said. Like, yeah, they're all very, very valid points. My counter to it would be that the Dolphins are a very different team to they were last year. So let's just take the, the defense, all right? So we're talking the vulnerability to mobile quarterbacks, you know, what Cam can bring. You look at the secondary now, you've got Byron Jones, who, while questionable, as is Xavier and Howard, if both of those go down, that's when I would lump the Patriots heavily. But if they both play, which I'm assuming they will, I mean, Byron Jones, for me, was the perfect fit for the Eagles. Like, you know, I was so on the yeah. Byron Jones train. I would still do it in a heartbeat. Um, I think when you look a little bit up further, you've got Christian Wilkins, obviously Devon Godshow at defensive tackle. I think they've got enough improvement defensively with guys like Kamu Grugia Hill, former Eagle, to come in and make a bit of an impact. The other thing is if you say, all right, well, the Dolphins have got better defensively. Have the Patriots got better offensively, really? Because they lose Tom Brady in game cam. You can answer that gives them another angle, another you know aspect to the game that wasn't there. But... Outside of Julian Edelman, you've got, what, 15-year veteran Matthew Slater and then Keel Harry. And outside of that, no one. Like, out, if you take the running backs out of the equation, there are no receiving weapons there. So, if you've got Cam Newton, so realistically, Harry's going to be taken up by Howard, I'd assume Edelman, if Jones shadows him, would be in the slot. Like, I can't see any of those guys doing enough to really pull away by more than a touchdown. At the same time... Dolphins offense, Fitz Magic's going to be your starter to begin with. Jordan Howard and Matt Brader in the backfield. I think their offense can match them. Will that be enough to go stride for stride and take on that Pats defense? I don't know. So I would say if the Pats aren't going to score and the, pay and the Dolphins can run the ball with Howard and Brader and keep pressure off of Ryan Fitzpatrick, then I really like the under here. So which, what number did you get that, that uh, spread at? I mean, the... Over under at 42? Uh, good question. So I've got it currently at under 42. Okay. Because in my head, I was picturing a 24-20 game. So I do right. think that number is going to be very, very close. Um, I think it did move down in the past couple days from what I was looking at. So, if so I feel like a good compromise here is if you can get it around 44 still, mm. I take the under. But if it's 40 to 42, I would mess with the over. I think that's my feelings here. That's but I did not want to pick a winner. Yeah, I was too scared yeah, yeah. to pick spread or pick a winner. But And you okay. should never bet scared. Big advice right there. Very fair. All right, so next game then we've got Cleveland at Baltimore. The Browns 7.5 underdogs going into this game. And obviously, you know, you've got the Browns coming in against a team that should have probably gone to the Super Bowl, that they're going to feel a little bit cheated out of it. They're going to want to come in with a burning passion. They're at home. And Baltimore is 60-20 and 20 at M&T Bank Stadium, which is very, very interesting. So, like, that's good. Um, the Ravens' rushing attack for me I think is what stands out against the Cleveland run defense, which I don't think is done enough. The, the big difference, though, is that Lamar Jackson's 5-4, and four, when rushing under 70 yards. So it's like, well, okay, if the Browns can stop Lamar Jackson, good luck, then they've got a chance, which is fairly understandable. But on that same note, on the other end of the field, you've got Jedrick Wills at left tackle against Calais Campbell. I love that matchup. That's going to be very, very problematic for uh, Baker Mayfield. The Browns do have Austin Hooper, but I, I just don't see it being enough. I think the Ravens are too good. I don't know how they got better. They had such a good offseason. It infuriated me that like a team got that far, had a defense that good, and somehow only got better. So I would take the Ravens minus seven. I would say seven. I don't know about 7.5. Like That one's annoying, so I'm going to wait till game day to see what happens with that. But if I'm picking that game, it's Baltimore all day. Yeah, I'm the same way. Um, I believe the Browns hired Stefanski, right, as their new yeah. coach. So I really do think, like, I was doing a little bit of uh, Stefanski research and seeing that uh, I think he's going to fit Baker the best, but I think he's, like, Baker's third or fourth coach in, like, four or five seasons, whatever it is. I think it's third coach in four seasons. And I do think that he's probably going to be the best fit for him. I think the Browns aren't going to be like the Browns last year. 
I think they're actually going to live up to some of that hype that they received. And I'm the same way, though. I don't like betting divisional games with big spreads because divisional games obviously can go any way no matter what. And I didn't bet the over-under or the spread in this game. And there's really no value in the Ravens' money line, I don't think. So I actually took Jarvis Landry scoring a touchdown. So I believe that was plus 230. Yeah, it was plus 230. Um, I do think I can't really get behind the I, – I do think Odell is just had a bad year and he's going to come back better. Um, but I think he's just the next – he's not going to be Antonio Brown, but he's the next head case waiting to burst. So I don't want to put any reliance on him whatsoever. I mean, he does so have I, a bad week as well. I mean, let's be honest. You look at all the stuff yeah. on social media, which – we yeah. won't get into too much, but I, I fully get that. And all it takes is a little bit of frustration. You saw the, the kicking that incident when he was with the Giants and the many outbursts he had there. I don't think Baker Mayfield, if that does happen, is going to have the same tolerance level as Eli Manning did as someone that had been around for so long. Probably had a lot more patience to him. I think Baker would be a little bit more snappy. So definitely something to watch with that for sure. Yeah, and like, I, I do like Odell. I, I, I think he's gets a lot of heat for no reason from media and apparently women on podcasts. <laughs> but I I don't know. I just, I don't see him doing anything on Sunday and I don't see him doing as much as Jarvis this season. So I, my best bet would be Jarvis plus two thirty If you're going for value. No, I like, I like that. That's a very good shot. But again, especially against that defense talking yeah. of value, obviously one of your major picks there was Buffalo. We're going to move on to that game now. So New York Jets, Going to this 6.5 point underdogs against the Bills on the road. For me, again, this is a no-brainer. I mean, would you take the the spread here, though? So, my main question when I was looking at this game was, am I ready to go all in on this Bills Mafia and jump on a table? And I think I am. (laughs) So, Buffalo covered at least 6.5 points in 8 of their 10 wins last year. Mm. And the Jets failed to cover by six and a half points in eight of their nine losses last year. So that's where, again, though, like you're betting a very big spread in a divisional game, and I never like to do that. But if this line stays under seven, I'm taking it bills all day. I think they win by the touchdown, possibly even like 10. But um, I could see why people would avoid this game. This was one of those games in like my middle category that I was talking about. But I'm definitely leaning Bills by a touchdown. I would go. Do you know what? Again, this was one of the houses I gen- houses. So one of the bets that I'd love my house on. Um, for me, this is a no-brainer. I mean, you look at that Jets team and it is falling apart. You lose yeah. Jamal Adams. You've got Mosley that dips out of the season. I forgot about that. Yeah, like it's and it wasn't just that they lost Jamal Adams. Like the team wanted to keep him. The teammates yeah. wanted him back, and it was just a total disconnect. You've then got their receiving corps that lost Robbie Anderson. You've got Brashad Perriman. Denzel Mims, I was never high on anyway. Everyone loved him in the draft for the Eagles. They were like, oh, he's so big and he's so quick. And I was like, and then he gets locked up against a sixth round pick in a bowl game. Like, for me, I don't, I don't like it. I don't like their receiving corps. Both players are questionable already. So that's already a red flag that Perriman and Mims are questionable. Sam Darnold, bless him. Like, they'll ride Levy on Bell as much as you can. But... New York is 3-10 and ten against the spread in AFC East games recently. And I'm, I'm ready to go on Josh Allen with that defense, who now has Stephon Diggs and Zach Moss and Devin Singletary. Yeah, I'm, I'm in. I'm fully in. Like, I'm, lump- I'm going into the bookmaker tomorrow, and I'm putting my Jack Russell on the counter. And I'm just going to say, just hold him there for two hours. I'll come back and collect the grand. Like, that's my theory with this game. So I'm all over it. I love Buffalo. Um, I, I think I'm probably a little bit more confident than you are by the sounds of it, and that's probably scaring me. But either way, the dog's currently at the bookmakers, and that's a reality we have to live with. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it's just kind of weird for me. Like, I have this problem where, like, teams that were, like, bad, I have a weird time betting on them to begin a season with the hype. That's why I didn't really fall into the Browns last year. But I think the Browns were an anomaly. I don't think the Bills are the Browns. And, I mean, 
I real this is a fantasy note real quick, but like if anybody has Zach Moss sitting on their waiver wire or their free agents in fantasy, mm-hmm. go pick him up. Um, Singletary has a lot of fumbling issues. I'm a big Singletary fan too. I actually picked him in a keeper league, and I still have him. I I'll probably be starting him this week. But Zach Moss, big pickup if you have room on your bench. All right. Love that. Looks like we're both on the same way. So it, I think if you hear me and Ricky both agree on a pick, that's probably a good sign. Uh, I'd like to think anyway. Um, yeah. Next game then, we've got Las Vegas on the road to Carolina. Obviously two very different teams there. It's another tricky one. Mm-hmm. I personally think that the Raiders on an Eastern time zone playing at 10 a.m., you know, it's in the t- I'm focusing a lot on times here just because I think, again, no preseason, no OTAs, might be a little bit lethargic, could be a bit slower. Carolina's receiving group is unbelievable, and Christian McCaffrey exists, so that's good. You know, any time that that man is just alive, that's a very good yeah. team to have. Um, and you've got four rookie starters on defense for Carolina, and I know that's been a bit of a concern, but... Brian Burns and Gross Matos, like, I'm fine with that. Like, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. I really love the addition of Trey Boston at safety. I was praying the Eagles would get him. It didn't happen. I love Boston. Um, and you get a home team as a three-point dog? Like, yeah, I'm in yeah. with that. I, I would take that all day. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure, I'm not sure if it's the same way with the books you use, but I'm almost positive if you're a home team, you automatically get two points. So... Well, not automatically, but that's typically like a, a just a generalized statement. So technically, Vegas sees the Panthers as five point underdogs, and they're giving them two points mm. as a, because they're a home team. And I I don't see all the hate around the Panthers. Yeah. I like I, I don't get it. I'm obviously not so familiar with like names as you are. Um, you're more of the football guy, but like I love Josh Jacobs. I also like Derek Carr. I think Derek Carr is kind of just in a really bad, unfortunate situation. Um, but I don't see why the Panthers are getting all this, like, three-win, like, three, four-win vibes all of a sudden. Um, I would try to get this line to be three and a half if you're betting Panthers, which is probably what I'll do. But I think that they'll probably win the game. So plus three is pretty much of a lock. This is a game I put in my category I'm not betting just because – I have absolutely no idea what to expect, especially out of the Raiders. The Raiders are such a random team. But, I mean, if you could get the Panthers plus three and a half, I feel like it's a lock. So. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think anything, I, I, there's something about that Panthers team where I, that was a line that stood out to me as a, huh, really? R- yeah. Really? I had to double take and make sure it wasn't flipped. But good to know. We're, we're on brand here. We're doing very well. Yeah. Um, next game up, Seattle, Atlanta. Tricky. Oh, I really didn't like this. I really, 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 really didn't like this. I'm going to come to you first because you sounded fired up. You're like, oh, okay, <laughs> so let's see what you've got. I'm so confused. Like, everything you read, apparently the Falcons suck all of a sudden, and I don't think they suck. No. I like, I, 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 but it was so weird that they're two and only two and a, given two and a half points. Like, uh, I, the problem is, year after year, like, Russell Wilson somehow manages to be slept on when he's, like, easily a top quarterback in the league. Like, no one ever talks about him, I feel like. I don't know if that's just what I see on Twitter and stuff, but I feel like he's one of the least talked about quarterbacks. But on that same page, Matt Ryan is, too. So, yeah. it's such a... But, like, so, during the Dan Quinn era, though, and this, I just wanted to put out there in case any reason... This, these stats are from betlabs.com. But during the Dan Quinn era, the under has hit 62.5%. They're 15-9 of the time in Atlanta home games against non-divisional opponents. I know that's like one of those stats where you're just like extracting every possible thing to make you sound right. But um, it was an interesting thought because that percentage does rise to 83.3%. So the under is hit in five of six games in games with a spread of three or fewer points as well. So... I wasn't picking a team in this one. If my heart and my brain tells me the Seahawks, because why would you bet against the Seahawks? But I also, I try not to let bias get in the way. But, like, I don't want to bet on the Seahawks because I don't want to root for them, even though I really, really respect Russell Wilson. So I picked under 49 and a half. Oh, Ricky. You saw, see, I've done the same. I've done exactly I, the same. 
So uh, I like. Do you know what? I was really worried. Like, what if we have all opposite picks and everything? But the fact we've actually got the same on a lot is encouraging. Makes you feel comfortable. <laughs> like for me, Atlanta were ravaged by injuries last year. It was terrible. Like I think they were probably the only team to have it as bad, if not worse, than the Eagles. And they started one and seven. Somehow finished six and two. So two totally different starts to the year. And then you take that momentum and everyone's sleeping on them, like you said. You partner in this hype of Jamal Adams in Seattle now. You've got a very, very good receiving group. And the fact that, for me, what the biggest um, contributing factor to this pick was that Schottenheimer, the offensive coordinator for Seattle, just loves to run the ball. And it's been to his uh, success and to his failure. Like Fans love it when it works and they despise it when it doesn't and they don't do anything but run the ball. But if you're going to take Seattle on the road, that mentality of running the ball, a new acquisition in Jamal Adams, who may take a little bit of speed to get out running, a fully healthy Atlanta defense that I think can handle in a tight matchup, I think under the play. I really do. So I, I fully agree with that one. Um, next game up then is the one I think most people listening to this podcast will be waiting for. Philadelphia at Washington. On the mm-hmm. road, they opened the season there last year. Minus five at the moment. Oh, I, I don't know. This, this isn't one I would bet and put my dog at a bookmaker, put it that way. It's one I would lean very slightly. Like I said, if I had £5 left in my account, I would probably play around with a parlay and have that in there. Um, it's a new look offense for the Eagles. We don't know if Jalen Rager's going to play, but according to a source who we're very familiar with, mm. um, <coughs> Chris Infanzo, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jalen Rager should be going. He should be good to go. Whether or not we'll see much of the field is anyone's guess and obviously he's still behind Deshaun Jackson on the depth chart anyway. The thing to bear in mind, there are a couple big problems here for the Eagles. A, that offensive line. Where do you look at it? You've got Jason Peters playing left tackle against Chase Young. Yes, it's better than Jordan Mylata, but Chase Young might be the closest thing to the Incredible Hulk I've ever seen and that terrifies me. So you're looking for the Eagles to use a lot of screens and stuff and that also fits very, very well with the fact that if you're going to match up to Sean Jackson and Ronald Darby, you want Darby biting underneath. Because Ronald Darby can carry deep. He's a quick cornerback. It's the only thing he does well, to, in fairness to him. So if you're going to send him deep every time and you're going to try and get to Sean Jackson, it won't happen. You need to do a lot of ins, a lot of slants, a lot of quick plays to A, get the full effect of Chase Young away from Carson Wentz for as long as possible. And B, really try and capitalise on Ronald Darby in the open field. If they do that... I think they've got a chance. On the other side of the field, you've got Terry McLaurin and Darius Slay. That terrifies me. And I know a lot of people look at Darius Slay like some saviour and that he's absolutely incredible. I'm nowhere near as high on him as a lot of people are. And I get shouted at all the time for it by my writers, by you guys, by just about everyone. Because I was in love with Byron Jones as a schematic fit. Now, for context, we know that Terry McLaurin ripped the Eagles apart last year. He had 255 yards. 10 catches and a pair of touchdowns over two games. Against Darius Slay and the Lions, he only had 71 yards, which is still pretty, you know, it's not great, but it's not terrible. For McLaurin's season, that's pretty tame, though. What worried me, though, was he was burned on two separate occasions that were incomplete, where Haskins overthrew him. They should have been touchdowns. There were two more incompletes on a slant where he missed an open field tackle and the ball somehow came loose. That should have been a touchdown. And there was a rub route where Slay went the wrong way. That should have been a touchdown. So that's four where if they'd have been complete, it would have been a very, very different day at the office. And Slay went out and said after the game, McLaurin is the second most challenging receiver he covered. He's now going to do that twice a year. That matchup, I, I don't, there is something about it that doesn't sit right. And if Haskins has taken a step forward and he does have a bit more touch on the ball, I'm a little bit... On the edge. Now, I would still ride Eagles minus five because I think that overall, the offense outmatches their defense. Carson Wentz should be able to put up points in buckets. If Miles Sanders is good to go, it matches up very well in open space against those cornerbacks and linebackers. But Mm. it's the other side of it. And I don't think that this matchup specifically is going to reward that secondary. Like For for Darius Slade to have his full impact and not be a man in press, it you're not going to see that in, until after a guy like you go into week two that would work better I don't think Terry McLaurin is going to be this Darius Slay highlight real game because it's just not um, so I, that's where I'm at I would I would lean very gently to the Eagles minus five but I, I'm sitting on as someone that has followed just about every move this team has made 
that matchup with Slayer McLaurin, I it doesn't sit right with me. So it's funny because I pretty much had all the same stuff written down because I think I've seen all the stuff that you write and put in like the Slack chat and stuff. But um, it's funny because when I first was going through FanDuel and looking at the games, I saw the words Philadelphia Eagles versus Washington football team. And I just closed my eyes and envisioned Deshaun Jackson catching a deep 75-yard touchdown after a touchback on a play-action pass, just like last year. <laughs> and like, um, and just like in the past, I mean. So like, the fan in me is like, oh, the Eagles are winning this game 100%, which they should. And then I also had written down that it sounds like Rager could be in, and I put dot to dot, thanks, flipping the birds. So <laughs> shout out. <laughs> And Brian, but um, if you're going for just like a lock, I feel like the Eagles money line is the pick in this game. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the the price of that is. I have no clue. But I also was thinking, at, see, at first I saw that the at Washington's team under was twenty and a half. I saw that the other day when I originally bet it. So I took the under Washington team total twenty and a half. But now it's at 18 and a half when I checked about it an hour ago. And I really don't like that. I feel like they might score 20 points is my problem. Yeah. So yeah. now I'm caught up. Like if you're if you're betting and your book says 20 and a half, by all means, I think the under for Washington right there is the play. But now it's at 18 and a half most places. So if you're picking something, I would say the Eagles money line and just parlay it with something. But – this is a game that I would avoid completely just because it's the Eagles, and most of us are probably Eagles fans or Philadelphia fans. So don't bet with your heart and just let this game go out and enjoy it as you're a fan instead of losing money too if they lose. Yeah, no, I agree with that one. Um, we're going to move on to Chicago and Detroit, which is another interesting matchup. And I've noticed a theme here where kind of I'll take a game first and hand it to you and then go back. And the thing is for this one, I mean, I don't need to say anything. The only note I've got written down is just give me the Lions. And that's that's <laughs> just where we're going to go. So how do you feel about it? So my my first thought was this is like a, a Thanksgiving battle of the yes. dummies. <laughs> like, I don't know why. Uh, I don't know who's watching this game other than fans of those teams. Like, maybe I'll check it out because I'll have Red Zone on. But I have no desire to watch this game. Um, the Bears have actually lost six straight opening day games, I saw. And they barely slipped past the Lions last year. And the Lions didn't have Matt Stafford in either of those games. So, I think the fact that the Lions are only minus two and a half is insane. Like, they should win this game, I don't want to say easily, but definitely by a field goal. So, I would take the Lions... Minus two and a half. Yeah, no, I fully agree. I just, I don't like Mitchell Trubisky. I really don't. And I would bet against him every day of the week for that reason. Um, a game with more injury. That's the quickest analysis we've ever done. But that was amazing. That was like 30 seconds. <laughs> um, Colts and Jags, I feel like we, we could probably get into a bit more. Minus yeah. eight are the Colts on the road at Jacksonville. And they're two teams that are trending in very, very different directions. The Jags look to me like it's a 2021 team. There's no Fournette, there's no Ngakwe, they're just, there's no Ramsey anymore. They're just getting rid of anyone and everyone just to almost hit a cultural reset. But there's something about ugly underdogs. There's something about yeah. ugly underdogs in week one that I like. The Jags won 38-20 to 20 in the season finale against the Colts last year. Now, for the Colts... They had a relatively strong offseason. Are you really going to hang your hat on Philip Rivers here to put up damage if Gardner Minshew does take a step forward? That's one thing to bear in mind. As for Minshew, he's got LaVisca Chanel at wide receiver, who a lot of people were hiring through the draft process. He's got a good tight end in Tyler Eifert. They have lost three running backs, though, in the last two weeks, which means that they're probably going to throw a lot more, which I like. I, I really think if you're going to challenge Xavier Rhodes, who was really bad, like the last time we saw him play football, we did not have a good season at all. <laughs> then I'm going to take a home team and eight points. That's more than a touchdown. To just Can you just imagine being down 14 and a Gardner Minshew backdoor cover? Like That seems very on brand to me, and I'd be all for it. Yeah, honestly, I looked at this, and the first thing I wrote down was, seriously, dot, 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 another over a touchdown spread. Yeah. Um, 
this game I feel like is going to be slow paced. I I could see the Colts just because there was no preseason having Rivers hand the ball off a decent amount to start the game. And like I love Gardner Minshew. I think he's an absolute savage. I mean, football wise, I don't have an opinion, but as a person, he's hilarious. So I I just feel like the game's going to be another one I probably won't pay much attention to. I won't watch much. And if I had to choose, I'd probably take you can get the all under at 52 and a half for minus 260. And I felt like I know minus 260 is not very appealing to many people. But I mean, if you're betting a decent amount of money, that's easy money in your pocket. I don't think 52 points are being scored in this game. Um, but if I was going to pick like an absolute value pick, I'd probably expect someone like T.Y. Hilton to score. I didn't see a line for that yet on FanDuel, and I ran out of time to search other books to see what the line was. But, I mean, I could see – I know I just said Rivers is probably going to hand the ball off the start, but I could see him gunslinging a little bit toward the end of the game. Yeah, I, I, it's, a weird, it's a weird game. Yeah. And there is a trend as well that Indy is actually 1-9 and nine in its past 10 season openers with six straight losses, oh, wow. which – I I know uh, Frank Reich spoke about it recently and actually opened up and was like, yeah, we want to change it. So he's clearly aware and they might approach this with a bit more urgency. So I do see where you're coming from with it. I just think anything over a touchdown in a game like that where there's uncertainty on both teams, like, I don't, I, I'm, yeah, I would lean Jags. I don't like it. I wouldn't, you know, put a heavy amount on it. Like nothing more than one unit at a maximum. But it's, it's one of them. I think another game like that is Green Bay, Minnesota, which mm-hmm. is another tight rivalry game. We know these teams despise each other. And before I, I let you run wild with this one, I just want to give a stat, which I didn't realize, actually. And it goes back to, I think, why we were a little bit more cautious with that Philadelphia game. The divisional dogs in week one. If I was to just, if I was to ask you to guess, okay, the, the recent trend, a rough record, of, uh, of winter losses. So a, a divisional underdog in week one. Hmm. All right. I would say, are we talking with the spread or are we just talking money line? With I'm the, sorry if I said spread, that. I missed yeah. it. With the spread. Oh, God. I would say underdogs are probably... 15 and 5 over the past few years. So the stat I've got here, they're 51 and 32. They in okay. the last few. All right. So I knew it was going to be somewhat significant. Yeah. I was I was trying to do quick math and I can't do math. No, dude, it's fine. I, I should, yeah, it was really hard to kind of put a spectrum I, on I was that, thinking but... like 65, 70%. So whatever that comes out to yeah, be. Yeah, it's, it's really, really impressive. Yeah. So I'm just going to put that out there and I'm going to hope it kind of correlates with what you say. Otherwise, I feel bad. <laughs> well, I mean, I was thinking... I really do like this matchup for the Packers. Um, Aaron Rodgers is going to be going against the Vikings, who I think I heard on the radio the other day that they are they don't have like their top three corners this season or something. No, I didn't get the fact check them, that. Yeah. But I, I'm like, I was thinking, like, with all the speculation about LaFleur and Rodgers, and that Rodgers came out and said, like, they're best friends or something. He used, like, some kid's quote that I laughed at, and I can't remember what it was. But, or he was like hashtag friend goals or something he said. <laughs> something stupid. I feel like Aaron Rodgers just has something to prove this year. Yeah. And not that he really needs to prove anything. He's probably going to be in the Hall of Fame eventually. But, I mean, I think he does. Ha- he, he just wants to shut people up. And without the Vikings having their corners, I could totally see the Packers taking this game. I'm also, I was also completely on that free Aaron Jones trend last year. And I'm 100% on that bandwagon again. I think this is a favorable matchup for the Packers. And they'll, I mean, I would take the mo- their money line because it's probably better value. But if you want to take them at plus three or plus three and a half, whatever that line is, then that should be a pretty safe bet. Yeah, I was honestly in the same, but I was going to take the money line because I think the yeah. value there is definitely on the side of Green Bay. And bearing in mind, they, they swept them last year. And you've now got Minnesota where there's no Stephon Diggs anymore. So that becomes a bit of a setback. And the, the big thing for me is that Minnesota's home advantage has always been, 
you know, all the purple people eaters, oh, it's so loud, and oh, it's Minnesota, and it's, well, they're not going to get that this year, that's not there, so you've got Aaron Rodgers, without having to worry about silent counts or anything like that, Aaron Rodgers in any environment is scary, one where there's no noise to put him off, and he can just run the offense as usual, that's interesting, I'm very open to see that, um, the Minnesota offensive line doesn't fill me with too much confidence as well, so yeah, I would go all in with Green Bay, um, this next game honestly reminds me a lot of the Jacksonville one where I don't really know where I'd sit on it or sort of like the Chicago and Detroit one. LA Chargers at Cincinnati. Oh, God. Yeah. We got Lane Jenkins starting. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm starting. So uh, I hope you're all just back in the Bengals, boys. I'll do my best. I'll do my best. Uh, but Chargers minus three. I don't know how I feel about this. I think that both teams are breaking in new quarterbacks. You've got Tyrod Taylor who isn't bad, isn't terrible. Um, you've got Mike Williams, his main receiver, could be down. But then you've got me going up against Joey Bosa and Melvin Ingram. <laughs> I don't like that. I really don't like that. And I feel that this game is just headed for an under and an offensive slot first. Yeah, I mean, this game's not a sexy matchup on paper by any means. But I feel like if you like hard-nosed, like hit-you-in-the-mouth type defense... Then this game's right up your alley. It's kind of this game's gonna remind me of like a pitcher's duel in baseball. We have two aces on the mound. Um, kind of like you were saying. I think both coaching staffs are gonna be timid, uh, and probably want to establish the run. I don't know if Austin Eckler is really like an every down back. Like I don't know if this is me talking out of ignorance though. Like I'm not 100 percent sure if he's. I know he's really good, and I know he's really good at catching. I don't know how he is as a runner. Um. So I don't, and I also don't know who else they have out there. If I'm being 100% honest, but um, Tyrod Taylor, he's a former Super Bowl champion. I believe he was on the Ravens, right, when they won the yeah. Super Bowl that year. So I mean, and I always think Tyrod Taylor has been like just one of those journeymen. Like he's kind of like Ryan Fitzpatrick, where he has his moments, but he also has his moments where he's completely dreadful. And I want the Bengals to win this game. I don't know why, but I also think. And not to get into conspiracies, but like if the NFL wants people to watch this game, Joe Burrow is going to have to do like well. And I'm not saying you can't really rig a football game aside from the refs. But I would if I'm taking a bet in this game to force myself to watch it, I would take the Bengals to score first at plus 110. Mm. Um, that's what I would take. I wouldn't take a side. I wouldn't take the over under. I do like the under though. I don't know what the number is. I didn't write it down. Forty two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I would probably take that. I could see both teams staying in the teens. But I could t- definitely see Joe Burrow coming out on like his second or third drive after the jitters are away a little bit and scoring. I don't know how Tyrod's gonna fare with I mean he has Keenan Allen. I really I love Mike Williams. I know he hasn't really had a chance to play much, but I don't know. I just have a feeling that if the NFL wants people to watch this game, they'll find a way to have the refs call things for the Bengals to score. So. No, that's understandable. Um, <laughs> this next game, I really, 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 really like. Like This is the one that I very almost decided to try and tempt you away with, and I instead went with Buffalo, which... Oh, no, I went with Denver, sorry, my bad. Yeah, um, Denver. So there were three... If I was going to parlay three games into one bet and put a unit on it. So let's say for a unit for me is $20, right? So I would take three spreads of the Bills, Denver, and this game, right? I want to hear your pick first on it. Arizona at San Francisco. Oh, I knew you were going to say this game. I literally knew it. I'm in the same boat. But I hope we're on the same side. Well, this is, it's going to be interesting. All right. I gotta hear your, I got to hear your opinion first. You sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, okay. So I'm, I am in dreamland. With Arizona plus seven. Okay, all right, we're on the same page. All right, okay. good. All right, I love that. Okay, so Cardinals four and zero oh and one against the spread in their last five against the Niners. I like that. And San Francisco played the Cardinals last year, and they struggled mightily against Kyler Murray. Now at that point, obviously you've got Richard Sherman trying to take away the top receiver. Who at the time would have been Larry Fitzgerald with a little bit of Christian Kirk. Now you've got DeAndre Hopkins, and if that means that that CB2 spot ends up being a Keller Weatherspoon, and you've got Larry Fitzgerald on him, good luck, right? That's I love that. Mm. That matchup on paper is brilliant. You've also then got the fact that Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk, 
for the Niners are questionable. So if they both go and start that game, we don't know what their limitations are going to be. They lost Emmanuel Sanders, who's now on the Saints. And the Niners, and I, I really, really don't like this aspect of it because it shouldn't play into a decision. But ultimately, it will be a distraction for the team. Obviously, there's a massive, massive distraction with the wildfires right now. Like, there's a lot going on in that part of the country where it might pull away from the focus of football. There might be concerns of family and friends and close ones in the area. And understandably, that has to play a little bit into the line here. Yeah, I mean, first of all, like like you were mentioning, like I, I hope everything and everyone's okay out there. I'm on the opposite. I know you're even further, but I'm on the opposite side of the country. So I have honestly no clue what's the actually going on other than the fires. I hope everybody's okay out there. If anybody's living out there, let us know. But uh, I don't know if you saw that picture from the San Francisco Giants game of, like, the orange sky. That was legit. Like, that's going to be in a history book, that picture. Like, that's absurd. Like, I could totally see that playing a factor in this game. But um, I still can't buy into the 49ers, even with the Super Bowl run. And I, I honestly think they were, like, 10 minutes from winning the Super Bowl. Like, they blew a 21-point lead or something, didn't they? Yeah. Like, they— Completely blew that lead in the fourth quarter. But I, I don't know. I, I feel like you don't need a great quarterback to win a Super Bowl. But I feel like you need a good quarterback. And I think Jimmy G is a good quarterback. But I don't know if he's the guy to really carry them over the hump without a little extra help. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I, Jimmy G's a weird one, isn't he? I think. Yeah. I mean, he's one of those quarterbacks where... He's sort of always been that golden boy, and he came out of New England, and there was so much given yeah, up for him. And <laughs> I like just, he always win. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's a weird. One. I think that it's going to be a very intriguing matchup. And if this line was a five or a four or a three, I probably wouldn't touch it. The fact I get Kyler Murray with those receivers and a touchdown <laughs> when the Niners couldn't do anything against him last year, I just think that the, they've got enough firepower. Even if Jimmy G hits uh, heats up and can lift... I mean, yes, you've got George Kittle, and I understand the threat of George Kittle. He'll be very high coming off of that big contract. Will he get complacent? That's a factor. You never know. Week one, he's just got a big payday, put his feet up a little bit. Could be. Not saying he would. He's a professional, but you never know. Um, But if you're going to be limited to just George Kittle, and those receivers are down, any combination of Debo and Ayuk, then it's very much Eagles circa 2016 which were a team that were inconsistent. So I really like that line of Arizona plus seven. So that would be one of my best bets of the week without a doubt. Uh, I would, th- real quick, I would throw that in a teaser, honestly. If yeah. I'm betting, I would make that go up to like plus 13 and throw it in with something else and get minus 130 odds. That'd be optimal. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. So like for me, that bet with Buffalo and Denver would be, I think that's sweet. It's a very good chance of coming in. Um, yeah. we, we're getting to the end of our slate now. We're doing a, a really good job with this. We're, we're toting yeah. ourselves quite well. Um, Tampa Bay, New Orleans. This Ooh. is probably the headline matchup of the weekend in terms of the general viewer who just wants to watch a good football game. You've got powerhouse in New Orleans. You've got slant king Michael Thomas. You've got Alvin Kamara. Tampa Bay, you've obviously got Tom Brady. You've got Gronkowski. We don't know if Mike Evans is going to play, but they've got Fournette. A lot of offensive firepower here. I personally am just going the over for one reason, and it's not even the reason that I thought it would be, is that if you've got Leonard Fournette, you think that adds a totally different dimension to the team. That's fine. He's only been there a couple of weeks. He's not going to be fully up to speed yet with the playbook, with the assignments, with how the, the offensive line works, with the scheme. Mm. So he's already a bruiser between the tackles. If he starts missing holds and his gap discipline isn't quite there, and they go down early, which can happen. The Saints, if they get rolling, are unstoppable. Like, they're unbelievably hard to control. So if the Saints, who are at home, get off to, an, uh, let's say, a, a 10-point lead at the end of the first quarter, which is feasible, you're not going to be running Leonard Fournette for three yards a carry. It won't happen. You're going to need Tom Brady to throw. And if Tom Brady's throwing, I think you've got that. that's an easy cover on the over for me, which is at 47 and a half. Yeah, I mean, so I'm a... I know a lot of people hate advanced stats and advanced analytics and all that nonsense, but I personally think I like it for betting purposes. Um, Cause when you're betting, you don't really 
if, unless you're live betting, you're not like using your better judgment to bet like you're using stats. So um, Brady's OK. So I was looking at DVOA, which is basically just your value over the average. So Brady's was actually almost identical. His like value over average stats to Winston, um, which is very interesting. This was this was last season, not for a career. But um, so with that said, I know he's in a different situation. I know he probably has better receivers. I love Chris Godwin. I love Mike Evans. Um, and now he has Gronk too. But are the Bucks going to be this year's Browns? I don't know. Mm. Um, this this line actually opened as Saints minus six, and I feel like that says a lot about odds makers' perception of the two teams. Um, this is just people saw minus six and then everyone saw that the Bucks were plus six and started slamming it because they hear the name Tom Brady. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But do I trust, do I think Tom Brady himself is worthy of two and a half points for that line to swing? I don't. Um, if the line I believe is, I think it's at three and a half right now that I last saw yeah. like a half hour ago. That's probably going to keep moving to like three, two and a half. I would do take an alt line down to two and a half and say the Saints are going to win by a field goal. And you're going to get great value with that because it's already at three and a half. So Tom Brady's 43 years old, best, one of the best, if not the best quarterback of all time. Never want to bet against him with a big spread. But three, three and a half, two and three and a half is a little iffy. But if you can get that to two and a half, I feel like it's a lock. Yeah, no, I'd be tempted. I think, for me, I'm not going to bet this game at all. Like, this is one that I'm yeah. just staying away from. Um, but I could definitely see that happening. One game I do like, though, and I'll be tempted to lay a unit on this one. So, so the ones I'm laying are going to be your bet. Uh, the, the one I've kind of made mid-podcast, and then a couple of the singles as well. But this one, Dallas and the Rams. So Cowboys go into this three-point favourites. I, I don't know. I think the Rams have got some offensive line problems. I've never been high on Jared. I, I say that. I mean, I wanted the Eagles to take him over Carson Wentz, but don't worry about that. Um, moving on. So, Cowboys, I, I just think, look, the Rams go and splash out on Jalen Ramsey. And it's very much what we saw with the Eagles, right? They go and splash out on Darius Slay. All right, you look at Mari Cooper up. Well, now you've got CD Lamb to worry about. Great. Mm. So now it's Lamb against the CB2. The Cowboys' offense led the league in just total offensive yards. I think they were like 415 yards per game yeah. last year on average. Mike McCarthy should be better than 8-8 eight and eight with an offense that high-powered. Absolutely better than 8-8. Eight and eight. And is an 8-8 eight and eight team good enough to beat the Rams? Absolutely. The Cowboys mauled them in Week 15 yeah. last year. Zeke ran all over them. I can't see a way the Cowboys lose this. The Rams open their new stadium with no fans in it, so that's great. I'm laying Dallas here. Yeah, I mean, I was the uh, I looked at it and I was like, literally the first question I wrote down was the Rams are only plus three. Like why? Like the Cowboys like what am I missing that Vegas is seeing? And as much as I don't like the Cowboys, I think my distaste toward Jared Goff may be worse. Um and on that same note, screw Skip Bayless for whatever for the stuff he said yeah. about Dak. I had to put that out there. That's clearly irrelevant, but that, that was uncalled for and completely unnecessary. But um, I would bet the Cowboys to score first and win this game. That's at plus 160. Um, I'm very confident that the Cowboys offense is going to come out. And as much as it sucks to say, they do have such a good offense. Like, they they built that team to be offensive, and they did a very good job at it. Um, they're going to come out, score early, score often. Plus 160 for them to win and score first is great value. I'm sure Zeke is going to score a touchdown too. That's probably around like they don't have that number out yet, but it's probably like plus two fifty, plus three hundred. Good money there. I'm sco- I'm anytime touchdown score for a guy like Ezekiel Elliott is a pretty much a lock every week. You'd make your money by the end of the season, put it that way. So, uh, yeah, I Cowboys score first and win is my bet. Yeah, we're now on to penultimate bet. I've already given my one for the last game of Tennessee and Denver, but the only other one remaining. Pittsburgh at the Giants. Steelers minus six. Giants. I, I don't know. The under's forty-eight, and there is a lean. There is a double lean here. I think for me, where I could parlay a team and a total, and mm. it's a new coaching staff for the Giants, and there's no preseason. That's a big worry for me. 
I understand Saquon Barkley, like Christian McCaffrey, simply existing is enough to tilt things in his favour. What I really, really like about this matchup from a total perspective, though, is that, yes, Big Ben is healthy. Yes, there's a concern of can anyone contain James Conner. I think a lot of people forget here that Leonard Williams helped massively last season for the Giants. And after his acquisition, I think it was week 10, it was right before the deadline, they then held Le'Veon Bell to under two yards a carry, Montgomery under two yards a carry, Aaron Jones under two yards a carry, and Sanders at three yards a carry. That was big. On the Steelers' defence, you've got TJ Watt and Bud Dupree, you've got Cam Haywood at defensive tackle, Minka Fitzpatrick is a god amongst men, and Daniel Jones led the league in fumbles with 18. I think there's going to be a couple. I think this is destined for an under, but if you're going to play both, I think you're getting the Giants plus six and an under. That'll be the way I go. Uh, actually, first things first, Um, not to go off topic here, but I just got a notification from FanDuel that they're doing a spread the love for the Cowboys-Rams no, game. Have they heard about our podcast? Yeah, so I just got that <laughs> breaking news. Um, so every 5,000 fans who bet on the Rams to cover moves to the point. Um, I did that for the Lakers game a couple, like probably like a month ago, and the Lake it was like Lakers plus one hundred. Um, these lines get really big, so everyone go bet on the Rams and get that line really high, so we all win an easy forty five dollars. I believe it's a max bet of fifty dollars, so easy forty five dollars in your pocket. Um, but anyway, I really, really think the question here is the Steelers hype legit, and I think probably so. Um, as long as Big Ben stays healthy, I think that entire team is pretty complete and ready to compete in Big Ben's like latter years of his career. I think he's got a year or two left to really make a statement. Um, I have the Steelers minus five and a half. Again, it's not my most confident bet. I probably won't bet it at all, if I'm being honest. But if I had to pick, I'm taking Steelers five and a half for the same reasons you said about the coaching staff, no preseason. Daniel Jones, I think, is going to emerge this season, but not anywhere close to beat the Steelers in Week 1. Yeah, it's a re- it's going to be an enticing matchup. I think yeah. anytime you look at the Steelers in recent years, like they're one of the least buttoned-up franchises out there. You look at all the stuff with Antonio Brown, Big Ben's had his own fair share of events. I'd like to think they're turning the page. And I, I like that defense. That defense is stout, <laughs> but I like... Yeah what the Giants have done with Leonard Williams. They, they had a relatively fair off-season. That, it annoyed me. They didn't even draft that bad. That was a, that, They normally draft terribly. This one wasn't even that poor. So I, I can see it going from under. But the interestingly, what I didn't realise until very recently, like in doing some late checks before we started recording, was that the number originally jumped from three and a half to six. Now, at three and oh, a half, oh. I would have taken the Steelers. At six, yeah. I'd lean the Giants. So... For me, I'd keep an eye on it. If it gets any higher than six, I'd consider yeah, putting would... a fair amount on. Yeah, I... Man, if that was three and a half and I saw that, I would have taken that in a heartbeat. But I have them at five and a half right now on FanDuel. But obviously, we have different books, so anybody's yeah. wondering why. But um, if you can get them for under six, I could see like a, a 20 to 14, 24 to 17 type game. So... Yeah, I think, yeah. And just to go back to your Titans and Broncos thing, I think you do have me convinced. I don't know how much money I'll put down on it, but I guess I'll have to put a unit down. So I think you got me. I think I'm going to take it. Is he, is he announcing at the end of the podcast he's going to cheat? Yeah, is that it? I think I'm cheating. Yes, I'm cheating. All right, okay. We, we've done it. We've fully committed. So we're both cheating like the horrible men that we are. Terrible <laughs> precedent for a podcast. Not good. Should have thought of that better. Um, but in case you, you forgot, I need a refresher. Here are the notes that I've got written down. Um, and then we'll kind of cross-reference with Ricky in a little bit. So I've got Drew Lock 4-1 and one down the stretch. Now as Hamlet, Judy, and Sutton. That alone makes me a little bit flustered. I yeah. love KJ Hamler. Would have thought he'd be a great slot receiver for the Eagles. You have Jerry Judy outside, KJ Hamler in the slot. Like, just inject oh. that content into my veins. I love that. Um, Von Miller down. Obviously sucks, but... I think they've got more than enough with the altitude. That's the biggest thing. I think that has to be the X factor here, that there's no preseason to get these guys conditioned for a full game. The closest they get are like hour-long scrimmages in training camp. So a full game is a very different experience, especially when it's going to be at 10 p.m. at night 
in altitude yeah. you're not used to, I think they're going to gas out and I think it'll be a backdoor cover. So that would be, that's my reason for it, but it's definitely one of my best bets. Yeah, I might honestly, oh, I guess I can't change it because it's your bet, but <laughs> if I'm not doing this, I would make that an even three. So at worst it pushes. Yeah, that, I'll take that. I'll take that. Yeah. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of episode one of Spreading the Love. I think we've spread plenty of love this this afternoon. Yeah, definitely. I think, I, I mean, I'm going to keep track of, I'm, I didn't write all yours down, but I'm going to go through and do mine as the games end. Yes, yeah, same. And if we both come out with winning picks, I hope this podcast like blows up entirely because it deserves it. I hope so. so. Yeah, guys, if you're not subscribed already and you're listening to this on YouTube or anything like that, again, PSN Radio is now the home for Philly Sports Network podcast. We will have links in the description. Um, the Outside Insider will drop a little bit later tonight, so I'll try and cross-reference as much of this as I can to give you guys the best of both worlds. Um, but we will see you next week. Until then, though, where can people find your stuff on Twitter, Ricky? Uh, so my Twitter is at Ricky underscore Amandeo8. Um, I know my last name's a little tough to spell, but just go on PSN and you'll find me somewhere. Uh, you can follow, follow my fa- or like my Facebook page too, which is just my name. Uh, there's stuff on there as well, and definitely follow me on TikTok at the Daily John if you want some betting stuff. So yeah, Ricky is now a resident TikTok superstar, so you absolutely have to follow him. Uh, guys, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Be smart. First of all, gamble safely, all right? Don't actually bet your dog in a bookmaker. Only bet what you can afford to lose. That's always been the mentality. And I don't know what it's like in America, but in England, there's a saying called when the fun stops, stop. So if you have a really bad first game, just just leave it, all right? Just walk away. We'll reset next week. Do not chase your losses. Yeah, I need to take my own advice with that sometimes. <laughs> what? I didn't, didn't say a word. Also, uh, please don't hold us at ransom if any of these picks fail. We are working on you. We're just two gambling degenerates trying to spread the love. And on that note, guys, have a good weekend. Enjoy your football. I will see you next week. How are people? I'll see you all next week. Thanks for listening. <laughs>